Hi, Rebecca. Hi, thank you guys for having both of us and certainly an interesting time to be talking about the movie business. And so um, just to jump right into things, we're coming off two consistently strong weekends at the box office after a really, really tough year. We saw solid opening weekends for Quiet Place and then the latest Conjuring movie. So do you feel like movie going has returned? Well, I wouldn't say it's returned full force yet, but it's those are definitely some good signs. And, you know, in addition to the United States, uh, just during this whole pandemic, China and Japan both set record opening weekends. So all time highs. So we're pretty confident there's pent up demand. It's just a matter of we need consistent movies opening up, big movies opening up every weekend. Um, we're getting there. We've got uh, F9, the latest in the Fast and Furious saga, opening up at the end of the month, and then uh, Black Widow following that. And then I think you'll see some really, you know, compelling reasons to come to the movies every weekend. And yeah, we actually have for the first time in a while, a very steady stream of movies coming out this summer. If it's not at pre-pandemic attendance levels yet, when do you first see the movie business getting there and reaching that pre-pandemic height? Yeah, I, I think we'll see the occasional um, weekend that uh, beats the, week, the equivalent weekend from 2019. We're seeing some really strong advanced ticket sales from F9 um, when we compare it to the, the, the last in the franchise, the eighth. So we feel pretty good. I think on a consistent level, we're looking to probably the end of the year to really get back to levels we saw in 2019. Do you think that for now, movie going is going to get a bump just because people are kind of desperate to get out of the house, watch something that's not on Netflix or on their couch for the first time in forever? And if so, how do you intend to keep people coming back if they're just desperate initially to see anything that's, you know, not at home? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly hope so. I mean, we, we've got some optimistic expectations. You know, I, along with most people, I stream content at home on the TV and, you know, there's distractions and there's things. And, you know, I, I tend to really like serialized programming where I can binge. But when, you know, when you've got, you really want to see a movie, whether that's an action movie, a horror, um, you know, a great drama or love story, nothing really beats the big screen. I think some of the things we're trying to do to, to stand out is elevate our service offerings. Um, we're really pushing more premium formats. So we've got things like IMAX. Um, RPX, which is the Regal Premium Experience, where it's got Dolby Atmos, uh, laser projection. And then we've also have 4DX, which is not just seat movement, but 14 different atmospheric effects that happen throughout the movie. And we've also got ScreenX, which is essentially a 270 degree screen that really is more immersive. So and we recognize, you know, we're competing with some at home viewing, but really trying to set ourselves apart with different experiences. And um, in terms of marketing movies in theaters, showing trailers before whatever movie they're seeing comes out, um, that's one of the most successful ways to promote a movie, let people know what's out there. How are you reaching audiences to get them to come and see the trailers? You need to get them to that point if they haven't been in a movie theater in a year and a half. Definitely. Well, you know, it used to be the way you saw a preview of a movie was in a theater. You know, now most studios will break their trailer socially and on digital media. And we partner with the studios on that as well. I think we look at a variety of ways. You know, we'll incentivize our loyalty members and we know who's seen different genres, who may be interested in a particular movie, really send them an email or, you know, target them on social media with that trailer. But again, watching the trailer on your laptop or on your mobile device, very different than seeing it on the big screen. I think we wanna whet people's appetite for the movie 
And then when you're coming in to see a movie like F9, you know, you're, rest assured, you're going to see the trailer for, you know, Top Gun Maverick, because that's, that's a really similar audience. We want to get you excited, not just for the movie you're about, but for the movie you can see a few months from now. Have you guys been surveying or polling moviegoers who have been back in theaters? And if so, what kind of feedback have you gotten from them just about safety protocols or feeling comfortable being back in a enclosed space? Yeah, we have. And, you know, our industry is doing some surveying of moviegoers before they come to the movies. And we've seen a steadily increasing sentiment for wanting to come back to the movies. And it's been in the, the low 70% are ready to come back now. When moviegoers come back, so we're at Regal, we're talking directly to that 70% who are ready to come back and have in fact come back. We're seeing our best scores ever on customer satisfaction. And a big reason is kind of the safety and cleanliness of the theater because they see our operations team, our crew in the theater, really working, cleaning, taking care of them. Um, and so I think as those folks have come back, they're even more predisposed to come back again for a repeat visit because of what we're doing in the theater. And, and it's not just Regal. I, I give credit to our entire industry for really making a concerted effort to do what was needed to make people comfortable going back to the movies and watching movies where they need to be watched on the big screen. And a lot of movie theaters have had to make some adjustments, whether that's selling tickets online or spacing out seats. I know private watch parties were very popular. Are there any pandemic era changes that you think, oh, actually that worked really well. We're gonna continue doing that moving forward? Yeah, you know, at Regal, we took a slightly different approach than everyone else. We were one of the last large chains to read. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, bottom line, we just saw that uh, without a consistent slate of movies, we were losing more money being open than being closed. And so we reopened at the beginning of April, started opening our theaters when we saw that the, the line of movies were coming. Um, private watch parties is, is definitely something um, I think a lot of folks have had success and that's essentially in, instead of renting out an entire auditorium and paying for every seat in the house, you can basically rent out an auditorium and only pay for 20 seats. So you can do that for your family of four, or you can bring 19 of your friends and you've got the auditorium all to yourself. I'm not sure how relevant that will be a year from now. Um, you know, I think we'll wanna rent out the entire auditorium if we can with every seat, but other things have definitely come up. You'll see less and less uh, what we call box offices. So we're really driving people to kiosks for that, you know, minimizing the touches that they have and the interactions that they have. Um, selling of tickets digitally has gone way up. We're probably double where we were pre-pandemic in terms of the percent of tickets sold. Um, and then things like concessions where you can now order your concessions on your app. We've got a number of theaters that'll deliver it to your seat. We're not doing that everywhere just yet, but I, I, I think that's a trend that will continue to, to get people to just do things more through the mobile app. And you mentioned needing um, a steady stream of product because movie theaters can be open, but if there aren't new movies coming out, it's, it can be hard to entice people to come. And um, in the United States, the vaccination process seems to be going smoother than it might be in other parts of the world. Do you think that that is going to impact product just because the movie industry is such a global business. It doesn't rely entirely on the US market. Yeah, you know, I think it won't necessarily stop movies from coming out, but it, it may encourage studios to continue to do what, what we call is shorten the window. So some studios are going day and date with their product where they'll offer it in theater and on streaming like HBO and Warner Brothers are doing. Um, they've committed to only do that through the balance of the year. 
Um, others have shortened the window. So it, it used to be if a movie came to a theater, it was about 90 days before you could watch it in your home. So that window shortened, it's 45 days for most studios. Some are going even shorter than that. So, you know, I think that's, you know, that's something we've had to deal with this year. But because of that, I think the studios are more willing to bring product and, and we think it'll be more consistent movies. And then at the beginning of 2022, I'd say we'd look for a more consistent window. Probably won't be 90 days, but it'll be more consistent. You won't see as much day and date um, as we've seen this year. Yes, you bring up uh, what has been a very hot topic in the past year, and it seems like every single studio has been taking a different approach as to how they want to release movies. With Disney, they've put some on Disney Plus for a premium fee. Warner Brothers, as you mentioned, has their entire 2021 slate opening day and date on HBO Max. They've said in 2022 they'll have a 45-day window. Um, Paramount has indicated they'll have a 45 day window. Universal has a premium video on demand method. It's hard for me to keep track of as an entertainment reporter and that's my job. So I can only imagine um, the average consumer is probably not aware of these intricacies. Disney might be a different story because I think it has a little more brand recognition, but I don't know how much consumers know the difference between a Warner Brothers movie and a Paramount movie, for example. Um, does it make your job more challenging to say to audiences, you can't see A Quiet Place on HBO Max, not the same studio? How, how does that impact your job of getting people to be aware of what is in theaters? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that's really impacting the job. I think my role and my team's role is really to drive awareness, as much awareness as possible of every movie that's playing at Regal. There's some movies that have gone day and date that we've just refused to play. And, you know, there are individual negotiations with the studios. So we don't get too hung up on it. And I think the reality is, you know, there's only so many streaming services that consumers can subscribe to. And, and you know, you've got this paradox of choice within any one of the streaming services. And then if you're trying to manage multiple streaming, streaming services, it's hard to keep up. You know, I'm a guy, I watch probably 50 movies a year or more in theaters, but that's kind of part of my job. I'd say the average moviegoer is watching six. So we'd love them to watch every movie. We know the reality is they're gonna pick their favorites and then they'll probably supplement with streaming. And then for some that are, they'll wait the 45 days till it's available on, on a particular service. So it doesn't necessarily change your marketing protocols to set to promote a Disney movie versus um, a Universal movie when it's going to maybe come out on streaming or home video in a different in a different. Yeah, time not period. really. No, we so really the marketing team waits for the commitment that we're going to play a movie, um, and sometimes that doesn't happen until very close to the release date. So the earlier we can make a deal with the studios, the better, and then we can start promoting. And I think ideally we wanna be promoting a movie when that first trailer drops or the first teaser trailer drops and then continue to pulse the marketing on and off up until tickets are on sale and the movie releases in our theaters. Have you guys had to make tough decisions about the movies that you wanna play in theaters and the movies that you you know audiences would like to see, but you have to say, you know what, this isn't in our best interest because they can watch it at home and I don't know if they'll come to theaters. Yeah, um, we have. And, you know, there again, there are, we're playing all of the HBO movies, the Warner Brothers movies that are going on HBO Max. So we've made a commitment and a deal with them regarding that. With other studios, again, Sometimes it's individual movie by movie um, negotiation that happens, and sometimes it's the entire slate. So, you know, I think it's, you know, we've seen some movies that we've had to pass on that we wish we didn't. Um, there are some movies that the studios took, sold off or took directly to streaming and didn't even offer um, that we wish they would have. And, you know, we have to deal with that. It's, 
you know, it's a frustrating year in some aspects this year, but it's definitely a brighter year as we look to the future than last year at this time was. Has there been any data that has surprised you in terms of movie going habits? Because with a movie like Godzilla vs. Kong, that did pretty sizable business, even though it was available on HBO Max. What are you finding with this whole new world of these simultaneous releases? Yeah, you know, I, th I think you're exactly right. We, I would say we've been pleased with the performance of a number of movies with shorter windows or even the day and date. I think the question is how much bigger could it have been in the theater? Which I'm confident it could have been bigger, but recognize the studios are also, you know, measuring things that we don't have access to. And for HBO Max specifically, I know one of the things Warner Brothers wanted to do was drive subscriptions because it was relatively new. It was relatively unused by a lot of their HBO subscribers. Um, same with Disney when they launched Disney Plus not too long ago. So I think as they become more mature, I think it'll be less important for them to have every movie with a shortened window. And, you know, they may make decisions on an individual movie here or there to try to drive subscriptions and, and drive the satisfaction of their subscribers. But again, I think the, the way to maximize the potential long-term is give it a strong 45 day window in theaters. And after 45 days, whether it's Disney or Warner Brothers, they've got the movie, you know, forever for their um, subscribers and their subscribers only. And um, to get to the point where we do have a window that both the studios and the exhibition side is happy with, what has your message been to the studios? Well, you know, I think longer is better for us. Um, and I think we're gravitating to where 45 days is the new 90. So it was 90. We've got uh, probably half the studios that have committed to 45 days. Others have, have indicated a shorter window or it'll be a movie by movie decision. So I think, again, with 45 days, you're talking a month and a half for the super fan of a, of a movie title or a franchise. They're gonna wanna see it on the big screen and we wanna make sure that it's there for them. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll have to deal with it, but on the flip side, I think we're gonna have access to more movies that we wouldn't typically had um, when a studio sees that they can have a shortened window and bring it in theater and drive that box office and get all of that revenue that they may have passed on if they went straight to video or, or you know, didn't wanna wait for a 90 day window. Do you think that um, we've already seen shifts in the kinds of movies that played in theaters before the pandemic? Um, superhero movies, obviously huge. Rom-coms hadn't been as successful. Do you think that um, it's gonna change the types of movies that people want to see in theaters, whether that's uh, the genre or uh, big movie stars? What is it that people wanna see in theaters? You know, I, I, I don't think it'll change in the short term. Again, I do think we're gonna have access to more movies and we'll have more kind of smaller art house fair or independent movies that'll be there. I don't necessarily think they're gonna be the $100 million weekend openers that you typically see from the Marvel type movies. But even this year with Disney, Disney's got some you know less well-known Marvel movies coming out. And uh, we're hoping that, you know, that magic will still be there and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how they perform. If you have a bold prediction, do you think that a movie can open to $100 million in its first weekend? And if so, what do you think will be the first $100 million opening post pandemic? Oh, that, so the short answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> um, I will... You know, I'll go out and say either uh, Top Gun Maverick or um, No Time to Die, the next Bond franchise in the fall. I think at that point, you know, we'll be 90 plus percent vaccinated. I, I think people will be more comfortable and that's what we need. We just need more people ready to come to the movies and have the great movies to, to greet them. And just on a personal preference, what is the movie that you're most excited to see on the big screen that hasn't come out yet? Well, I, uh, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but I think Top Gun Maverick, and it's a movie that really is about 
Navy pilots. I've I've got an Air Force background, and uh, you know they're comrades in arms. So, and Tom Cruise is is just the best, and he's an absolute you know supporter of the industry. And uh, it's great seeing him make these fantastic movies that perform so well on our screens. Great, thank you so much. Sure thing.